Good afternoon. First, I'd like to thank the conveners for putting together this session and to say that although I wish I could be there in person, it's still great to participate virtually. For active or potentially active volcanoes, it's important to understand their long-term eruptive histories to contribute to holistic hazard assessments. This allows us to understand not just historical or even Holocene activity, but uncovers potentially larger and more hazardous events that are low probability, but potentially impactful in a volcano's past. Placing events within the longer term eruptive history can also provide insights into the magmatic processes that lead to eruptions. Today, I want to share results from work that I have recently published with Brian Jika on Akatan Volcano, one of the most active volcanoes in the Aleutian Arc and one of only five volcanoes in Alaska deemed very high threat in a recent threat assessment. It last eru erupted in 1992 and a shallow intrusion in 96 led to an intense seismic swarm of concern to local residents. In order to refine the Pleistocene through present eruptive history of this volcano, we used field mapping, argon-argon geochronology, and stratigraphically constrained whole rock geochemical data and built upon previously completed studies. We focused on the active western half of the island as highlighted here in yellow. For argon geochronology, we carefully sampled dense crystalline lava interiors wherever possible, as shown in the sample location photos on the right. I'll also note that while there isn't time in this talk to focus on the effects of glaciation on preservation and eruption style, it's clear that it played a large role at Akatan, and I encourage those interested to read more in our GSA bulletin paper. Next, I'll walk you through the eruptive history and then finish by providing some takeaways, some about this volcano and some that may be applied to stratovolcano growth more broadly. The oldest rocks in our study area consist of stacks of deeply dissected lavas and pyroclastic rocks that make up the volcanic basement of western Akatan Island that underlies more intact, discrete volcanic centers. As seen in the photo on the lower left, stacks of gently north-dipping basaltic lavas crop out immediately south of modern Akatan volcano. They apparently erupted from a deeply eroded volcano that was active over two million years ago. Here and in subsequent map figures, Argon Plateau ages are given in thousands of years in black on the maps. At the upper right of the map, a gabbro plug exposed along the coast was dated at 2.3 million years. And ancestral lavas that crop out north and east of modern Akatan are the remnants of a volcano that was active around 1.2 million. These ancestral lavas are mostly aphanitic basalts and have high incompatible element abundances and high and variable lanthanum to ytterbium ratios as shown by gray symbols on the plot. About three kilometers northeast of the current caldera rim, a complex of lava flows and breaches are the primary remains of the deeply eroded Long Valley volcano, shown in purple. Long Valley lavas are also mapped north, northwest, and west of the current Akatan volcano. This center was active from about 680 to 520 Ka, and it erupted mostly basaltic andesites and andesites. An eroded ridge five kilometers west of the current caldera is the remnant of a basaltic eruptive center, Lava Peak, shown in reddish-orange. Lava Peak basalts are crystal-rich and contain plage, olivine, and augite. Two argon ages reveal that Lava Peak grew concurrently with Long Valley Volcano. Except for one outcrop dated at 365 Ka, we map no major units of ages between 520 and 290 Ka. The earliest lavas at the base of the modern Akatan edifice, shown here in green and in upright green triangles on the plots, are basalts to andesites that erupted over a nearly 100,000 year interval and represent the initiation of volcanism at the site of what is now Akatan volcano. We sampled no lavas from the Akatan edifice that yielded ages in the time interval from 190 to, two, to 120 Ka. Black cap basaltic andesites and andesites, dated from 120 to 112 Ka, crop out south and southeast of the current caldera and are shown here in green. Flat top peak, a conspicuous flat iron about three kilometers southwest of the modern caldera, is the vent area for flat top eruptive center, shown in shades of red. All flat top lavas are plagioclase olivine basalts with or without minor augite. 
three periods of eruptive activity are distinguished by morphology, trace element abundances, and possibly vent location. Flat top grew from 155 to about 100 Ka, concurrent with the black cap period at Akatan. From about 85 to, for, to from about 80 to 45,000 years ago, Akatan was erupting basalts through dacites, as shown in shades of green. Basaltic andesites with sparse phenocrysts are the most prevalent during this period. At the same time, Cascade Bight Vent, about four kilometers to the southeast and shown here in blue, was erupting phenocryst-rich basaltic andesites and andesites with high alumina, large iron lithophile elements, and lanthanum to ytterbium ratios relative to arrays of Akatan edifice lavas. We didn't date any lavas from about 35 to 13 Ka. The youngest lavas that we did date by Argon Argon are andesites found high atop Black Cap Peak and the modern caldera rim, as shown in this photo. They appear to be the last lavas erupted before an explosive eruption 9,000 years ago, CFE1, that formed the caldera shown in the blue dashed line on the map. Following CFE1, more mafic Akatan Peak became the active vent and subsequent eruptions from it filled up much of the caldera, shown in blue. The vent location then shifted farther north and became more evolved, as evidenced by younger lavas that lap onto the sides of Akatan Peak and are present at the current caldera rim. Subsequent eruptions from this now destroyed vent became less evolved leading up to CFE2. At 1600 years before present, CFE2 produced the widespread basaltic andesite Akatan Tephra and formed the current caldera that truncates Akatan Peak. Since then, eruption of slightly more evolved basaltic andesites has formed the intracaldera cone and lava flows. During the late Holocene, andesite erupted during a single episode from a vent along the western coast, Lava Point, shown in orange, continuing the pattern of concurrent eruptions from disparate vents. For the next few slides, I'll be highlighting some takeaways from our work on Akatan's eruptive history. First, while we didn't focus on the early Pleistocene history at Akatan, we did observe that most ancestral lavas are basalts, in contrast to later, better preserved individual centers with wider compositional ranges. This sequence has been observed during the construction of stratocones in the Cascades and at volcanoes elsewhere in Alaska. Ancestral Akatan basalts have high abundances of incompatible elements and have variable and high lanthanum to ytterbium ratios. Because there is little evidence for widespread magma mixing or crustal assimilation at Akatan, the variations in lanthanum to ytterbium ratios are likely derived by low and variable degrees of melting of a modified mantle wedge, as first suggested by Singer et al. in 2007. We note that the transition from the mafic platform towards development of discrete, more evolved centers occurred at about the time of the mid-Pleistocene transition, which is the marked prolongation and intensification of glacial interglacial cycles that occurred about 800 Ka. Before this, cycles had a mean periodicity of about 41,000 years and less intense ranges. It's challenging to tease out issues of preservation versus cause and effect, but we propose the link between stratovolcano development, compositional variations linked to mantle melting, and large-scale changes in the glacial cycle are worth further exploration. Due to glacial erosion, tracking the long-term magmatic output at Akatan is challenging, as is the case at other high-latitude volcanoes. Its post-290 Ka volume is about 21 cubic kilometers, yielding a flux near the low end of stratovolcanoes globally. However, this apparent flux rate is likely the result of significant glacial erosion, as evidenced by gaps in its record that coincide with major glacial advances, as shown at the right. Looking only at the Holocene, Ak Akatan has erupted about 3 cubic kilometers over 9,000 years, resulting in a flux of 3.2 times 10 to the negative 4 cubic kilometers per year. Even considering the more accurate Holocene volumes, Akatan is less productive than average for arc stratovolcanoes globally. The modest magmatic output is interesting given that it is one of the most historically active volcanoes in the Aleutian Arc. 
One possible explanation is that it has a high intrusive to extrusive ratio and that a high flux from the mantle into the upper crust keeps the system hot, but that less magma is erupted at the surface. As highlighted throughout the talk, magmas with different compositions and mineral contents have erupted coevally from closely spaced vents throughout the Pleistocene and Holocene. Generally, more mafic and more restricted compositions from flat top and cascade bite are consistent with their magmas bypassing the main magmatic storage region below Akatan, whereas subtle trace element differences within these smaller centers may suggest modest variations in mantle sources. These examples show that closely spaced vents within volcanic clusters may be supplied by transcrustal magma systems that can remain discrete from one another even when just a few kilometers apart. Whereas Akatan is a dominantly tholeitic center, a subset of Pleistocene lavas erupted during the Long Valley and early Akatan edifice episodes are calcalkaline, as shown on the upper panel and defined by the Miyashiro line. Calcalkaline samples have MGO and nickel that are elevated above the main array. Plots of MGO against incompatible elements such as zircon or zirconium also form generally straight lines for calcalkaline samples versus a broad and more curved array for the tholeitic lavas. The compositions of these calcalkaline lavas can thus be best explained as mixtures between primitive basalt and evolved silicic compositions. The silicic end members must be variably saturated in apatite, as evidenced by phosphorus variations in the calcalkaline lavas. All intermediate calcalkaline samples are phenocryst rich, several contain mafic enclaves, and two of the analyzed compositions are of light and dark bands from a macroscopically mixed lava, lending further credence to the mixing hypothesis. Holocene lavas plot along discrete tholeitic basalt to dacite evolutionary trends that differ only subtly in initial titanium contents. Mafic Holocene lavas have diverse phenocryst contents, whereas andesites and dacites are phenocryst poor and lack pervasive evidence for magma mixing. The photo of the glassy dacite bomb in the center is one example. Chondrite normalized rare earth element patterns for Holocene samples, as seen in the upper right, are parallel with increasing differentiation, except for an increasingly negative europium anomaly suggestive of plagioclase removal. Plutonic textured blocks, shown in the photo at lower left, are present in the deposits of the CFE2. They span a wide range in compositions and are interpreted to represent one, completely crystallized injections of basaltic, and basaltic andesitic liquid, and two, crystal cumulates from fractional crystallization of the active magma system. In sum, Holocene Akatan magmas are dominated by tholeitic fractional crystallization in either a closed system or one fed by compositionally similar inputs. Finally, we can combine our results from the late Holocene eruptive history with those from recent geophysical studies to look at the current magmatic system beneath Akatan. Collectively, they support a conceptual model wherein the system is fed by periodic but frequent inputs from the lower crust and hot, relatively dry magmas stall and differentiate at 5 to 10 kilometers depth prior to eruption or ascend into the shallowest crust as dikes. Thanks for your attention, and I'll leave you with the takeaways, and I'm happy to answer any questions.